Yes, ma'am. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We, are, we say how uh, excellent is your name. We thank you for who you are, for what you do. We thank you, Lord, for another privilege, another opportunity to study your word. We ask to bless your word, Father God, that we will understand it as you intended. And bless your word, Father God, that will follow this soul, that men, women, boys, and girls will hear from you and bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Today is a is a it's a relatively challenging lesson. It has a tendency of um, a misstating or overstating according to the authors here. So we want to make sure that we hear what God is saying and see what God is saying as we as we go through this particular lesson. Let me welcome those who are listening by. Uh, Facebook Live, those who are participating uh, by way of Sunday School. Okay, today's lesson is entitled what? What is the, the title for today's lesson? Persevering faith. Persevering, persevering, persevering faith. What does the word persevering mean? What is persevering? Keep going. To keep going, to keep going, persevering. Anybody else? Hang on in there. Hang on in there. What does persevering mean? To suffer long through some things, okay? So you must persevere. Are there any things in our lives that we have to persevere through? Oh, yeah. COVID. Yeah. COVID-19. So they say, oh, yeah, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I must persevere. <laughs> so COVID-19 is something that we're having to, having to push through. Anything else we have to push through? Sickness, health. health. What is it? Delta virus. Just so life itself. life itself. We have to persevere through life. Right. So we have to hold fast to it. We have to make sure we push our way through it. <clears throat> because as we push our way through it, guess what happened? God is with us. Right. And as God is with us. Uh, even though on last night I had another cousin to pass away from the coronavirus. So we're pushing through. We're pushing, we're pushing our way through. I mean, it seems like after one funeral, there's another one on the schedule. Before that one is over, there's another one on the schedule. Yeah. So we have to persevere. And we have to believe God even through that. That's right. We have to trust God. So uh, family members got together, and about 11 of them got the virus in one gathering. Yeah. Amen? So that's why I'm saying to you, we got to persevere. I don't understand why people don't see the need for vaccination. I don't understand why people don't see the need for masks, for washing of your hands, <clears throat> for doing what the CDC and the experts want us to do. So when we look at today's lesson, these uh, Judaizers or those who were Jews had to persevere through hardship. Now their perseverance is taking place at a time when when the government is fighting against them, when people are fighting against them, and they had to persevere through their faith. It's their faith that, that had them uh, strong. It's their faith that they had to lean on. It's their faith that they had to trust God through. And guess what? Today is no different. <laughs> it's going to be our faith that allows us to persevere. Amen. We have to depend on Almighty God. Amen. So we, let us do this. Let us do the, the, the story, whatever that story is called. Let's do the story. Then, Sister, Sister Henry, will you do the in focus? And then, uh, young man here, will, will do our main scripture for today. Read big, loudly, and clearly for me, please. I just want to aim for change. I want the story. That's the in focus. I no, I want you to read the in focus as you're closer. And Sister Henry will read the thing at the top. I don't have a Sunday school book, so. Um, no, I want the story first. Okay, in focus. Um, Anthony and Sh Sharita had dated for one year and been friends for eight. They had had their ups and downs in their relationship. Some bad decisions from Sharita's past kept coming back to bite her, it seemed. But with prayer and heartfelt changes, 
they would work through the troubles as they came. One Saturday, Anthony met with Mr. Williams, Sharita's father. Anthony said to him, may I have your permission to ask Sharita to marry me? I hope I love and respect your daughter and want to make her my partner for life. She is my blessing from God. Mr. Williams thought for a moment and smiled. You have my permission, Anthony, he said. Let's pray for you and Sharita's life together. One evening as Anthony and Sharita walked through the park, Anthony knelt on one knee and proposed. Sharita was speechless as tears ran down her cheeks. She said, I have made too many mistakes in my life. I can't, tru you truly can't love me because I have not forgiven myself. I don't deserve a life with you. I love you, but I can't marry you. As Sharita started to leave, Anthony said, we all make mistakes, but God gives us when we, but God forgives us when we sincerely come to him. I know you have a sincere heart. Otherwise, we wouldn't have made it this far. We can't let another little struggle stop us from the beautiful relationship we've been working towards. Through faith in Christ, our sins are forgiven and we have a new life. In today's lesson, we can develop a personal relationship with Jesus by faith and enter into the presence of God. Okay, before we get to the scriptures, let's let's talk about this story. So what's the key character here? Anthony, key, key character to Anthony and Sarita. So he wants to marry her. Right. He goes through the whole old fashioned way of doing things. He goes through the whole plan, right? A plan that people neglect during these days. And he goes through the steps, Go. he goes to the parents, he, he, he goes and asks for the father's blessing. He gets the father's blessing. Then he goes and he proposes to her. Is that something that we generally see during these days? No. No. So people don't go through those changes anymore. Matter of fact, people elope. People, uh, people leave here. People come back and tell you they're married. They don't go through those, those exercises anymore. But Anthony is his name, correct? correct? Anthony goes through the practice. He goes through the exercise. And so it seems like the young man is, is going to do everything right. He gets to a point when they're walking together in the park, he kneels down on one knee. I mean, he goes through the process. Are, are men kneeling down on their knees today? Most of them are not, right? They're just doing it, right? So he kneels down on one knee, he asks for her hand in marriage. From the father first, then from her. She's elated, she's glad, but she's tearful. Why is this woman so tearful? Is she crying because things are well? No. No. Why, Sister Henry, why is she tearful? Because of the things she had in her past. Because of her past. What kind of past do you think she had? Things that she's not proud of. Things that she's not proud of. Anybody in this room got things in their past that they're not proud of? Anybody, one person, huh? Raise your hand if you do. If you have anything in your background that you're not proud of. Even the 11 year old got something that he's not proud of. My, my, my. <laughs> so it tells us that we all sin, right? Not y'all sin, but we all sin. So all of us got something in, in our past. Sister Davis, how does this story end? Well, she doesn't want to marry him because, you know, she says she's made too many mistakes, but then he tells her that, that we all make mistakes and God forgives us. So okay, so she, she doesn't want to marry him. She doesn't deserve him. She doesn't deserve to be his wife. So he reminds her that all of us have sinned. God forgives us and God has forgiven you too. So how does it end? Does it tell us how it ends? Does she accept his hand in marriage? Or it just leaves it there? Okay, so it leads us to think which? That she's going to marry this good man. That she's going to marry this good man. That's, that's what the story is. It leads us to think this. But if she can never forgive herself, the marriage may not take place. If she can never realize that God has forgiven her, then the marriage may not take place. So she could miss out on a full life 
with a great man if she doesn't admit and doesn't accept the forgiveness of God. Is that how we are? Some people are, no, I ain't like that. <laughs> so I just ask for forgiveness and go on. So, well, she has a sincere heart, right? And so you have to respect the fact that she has a sincere heart. And she wants to live right before God. So many times we find ourselves in her position where we've messed up, we don't think we're righteous, we don't think we're saved enough, we don't think that we are good enough, we don't think that we've been forgiven, and so we miss out on life. Many people miss out on life because they believe that they can never be forgiven. But our story today, our lesson today, will tell us that forgiveness is available to all of us. Okay, Sister Henry, would you read, please? By the end of this lesson, we will explore the stories of early believers who suffered for the sake of their faith. Long for the courage to endure suffering as a result of our faithful witness and share in the suffering of Christians around the world. So there are people before us who suffer for what they believe. They suffer because of their faith in God. They suffer because of their determination to walk with Jesus. We have a lot more freedom today than they had. Is that correct? They didn't have the freedom to worship as we are in this room worshiping today. They didn't have the freedom to read scripture as we have today. And if we don't watch it, the legislature will legislate it where we don't have that freedom. I often wonder how do our country pray to God and ask for God to bless our country and we keep voting in and legislating sin. We keep putting sin on the agenda. We keep doing people wrong. We keep disobeying God, but we ask God to keep blessing. So Sam, what can you tell us what's going on with that? Well, while we keep asking God's blessing, and we keep, and that's the, what the lesson is talking about, we keep willingly, uh, knowingly sinning. So basically, we've gotten to a point where we've done wrong so long yeah. until it looks like right. It right. feels right. like it's right. And then our world and our nation, our cities, our states have accepted it as right. I keep saying Don Lemon said the church folk, the Christian people need to read their Bible because we got it wrong. God is not a God that will attack us for sin. God is not a God that will segregate us because of our sin. Don Lemon said, you church people need to check your Bible. And I'm still wondering what Bible he's reading, if one at all. He's reading the same when Oprah Winfrey's reading. Oh, so he and Oprah are reading, they're sharing him. You know, because there's only one way to God, and that's through Christ. Yes, sir. Uh, today's key verse is, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Okay. Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10, 23. 23. Hebrews 10, 23 says we need to hang in there. We need to hold on to our profession of faith. Why do you think the, the Hebrew writer had to remind them to hold on? Why did he have to say, hold on, don't persevere, don't give up. Why, why do you even have to say that? They lost their faith in God. Say again? They lost their faith in God. Because they were slowly drifting away from what they believed, right? And uh, sometimes life and pressures and people can beat you up so bad, you can wonder, where is God? But today's lesson talks about persevering. It talks about making sure that we do the right thing and stay focused on what God has given us. Now, let me just put a disclaimer here right now. 
because the lesson is very peculiar. It does not suggest to us that we can lose our salvation. The lesson is very differently written from what we have seen and what we see on a regular basis. But it is not saying that once you are saved, you can lose your salvation. It is saying that you can walk away from the God that you have always been with since you've been saved. You can turn your back on it. That word is known as apostasy. And the, the Bible teaches that there will come a day where the church will go into apostasy. Apostasy is when church folk walk away from God, walk away from Christianity. So it, it begs the question, were they saved? And it introduces a new question that is not new to many, is that can you be saved and still walk away? Question to you, can you be saved and still walk away from the Lord? Yeah, you, can turn your back on the Lord. you can turn your back on God? Does, one thing always say? Does, does that turning away include losing our salvation? And this has been an age-old question for many years. People continue to entertain it. If I'm saved, can I lose it? Let's look at the text. We, we got to keep in mind now, the Hebrew writer oftentimes compares the Old Testament to the New Testament. He oftentimes juxtaposes the, the new with the old. He oftentimes say, well, this is what the old says, and this is what the new says. Let's, let's talk about it. First of all, in order to understand the entire pericope, you got to go back to verse number 19. Verse number 19 talks about drawing close to God through the boldness of Jesus Christ. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, we have entered into holiness. Not only have we entered into the holiness, we only enter into the holy of holies through Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can enter into holiness because we are not holy ourselves. We are not holy. Jesus has made us righteous. He has made us holy by his death and burial and resurrection. When Jesus died on Calvary, we are now considered or declared righteous. And we are not righteous except through Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, by a new and living way which he has consecrated, consecrated to us through the veil that is to save his flesh. Jesus died a fleshly life. They beat him and they killed him. But when he died on Calvary, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. This is seen in verse number 20. The veil of the temple was rent from top, it was torn from top to bottom. And because Jesus has ripped that veil, because God has torn that veil, now we can go before God and enter into the Holy of Holies ourselves. We still only get there through Jesus, but we don't have to go through the priest anymore. We don't have to go and set an appointment with the preacher anymore. What would it look like if you needed to pray and you would have to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning? What would it look like? And this is what they had to do. They would have to set a certain time of the year where everybody would gather. The priest would go behind the veil. He would make intercession for the people before God. And when he made intercession for the people before God, if that joker wasn't right, they'd drag him out and, and he'd die. He'd drag him out and send another one in. The second guy in line became nervous. Every time he went in there, every time the first string preacher, the first string priest went in, the second string got, really got nervous because he began to play back in his mind, am I living right and have I messed up? Verse 21, 
and, and having and great high priests over the house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, Jesus has died for us and because he has died for us, now we have been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. Now we are considered righteous. Now we are considered holy because of Jesus Christ. Questions or comments? And so now we can draw near to him. And we can draw near to him on our own. Because we have a great high priest. The high priest is Jesus. We have this great high priest, Jesus Christ, and he is over the house of God. Jesus Christ, now we can draw near to him. Because the only way they could draw near to him is through the man, the physical flesh, the priest. But after Jesus died on Calvary, now we can draw near to him. Questions or comments? Sister Henry, you got that look. I see it through the mask. Okay, let's go through the verses. It's, it's, it's kind of extensive. Let's go through the verses. Volunteers, let's read through the verses. Read as many as, many as you would like to so we can get through it, okay? Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without <clears throat> wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more that ye see the day approaching. Okay, let's stop right there. So we stopped at verse 26. We'll start at verse 26. So we, he says to us, hold fast to your profession of faith without wavering. Hold fast, persevere, stand on what you believe. Your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, hold to it, stick with it. Whatever you do, don't let anybody turn you away from it. Hold fast to it. How many people have felt discouragement during these last two years? How many people have wondered, where is God in all this? <laughs> How many people, I mean, regardless of how spiritual you are, how many people have said, God, when are you coming through? God, when are you going to shut this down? God, when are you going to take our enemies out? God, when are you going to stop the Social Security folk from messing with my money? When are you going to get my SSI started? And it looks like, and, and even from a Christian standpoint, it looks like God has turned his back. Yeah. It seems like God is not hearing our prayers. Mm -hmm. How many of you have prayed, God, take away coronavirus? Uh, oh, I have. How many have prayed, God, send coronavirus back to hell where it came from? Well, not like that. <laughs> well, you need to start praying like that. Maybe you can go. <laughs> no, I say take away those enemies like stab it. <laughs> Get rid of governors that, that don't try to do us right. Right, yeah, man. Let me just share with you. In the midst of all that's going on around us, we need to hold fast to our faith. He says, hold fast to our professional faith without wavering. In other words, don't go back and forth. Don't, don't swerve. We have to have our faith unswervingly because this is what keeps us focused. Look at the parentheses. For he is faithful that promise. That's what's keeping us going. <laughs> the one thing that's keeping us going and content with what God has promised is that God is faithful to what he has promised. He has shown himself to be faithful. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. What is that talking about? We need to consider one another. Paul says in Galatians, those who are strong are the bearing infirmities of the weak. 
We got to consider one another. And we have to spur each other on to love and good works. We need to be team players. A person who's not a team player will never be good for the team. He may be good for the MVP, but he's not good for the team. If Steph Curry was selfish, he would never be the MVP because it takes a whole team working to make him the MVP. He can't bring the ball in by himself, drill him down the court by himself, shoot it every time. That's, that's greediness. Such it is in church. We gotta spur each other on. We gotta, we gotta love one another and spur each other to love others. We gotta spur each other on. We gotta look out for one another. And we have to spur them on to love and we have to spur them on to good works. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together in a manner that some do, but exhorting one another in so much that we see the day coming. Which day do you think is coming? Jesus is coming back. In other words, don't find yourself missing the assembly. And God has made it possible now that you don't have to miss church regardless. Some people listen to seven church services on Sunday. Some people listen to three or four Bible studies during the week. Some people listen to two or three Sunday schools. We even have businesses watching us this morning. God has made it of such a way that we don't have to miss out on the assembly. Now the word assembly means coming together. The word assembly, uh, it, it follows after we see the word spurring each other on. We have to exhort one another, encourage one another. Stick with one another. Just because you don't like her, she's on the team. You can't win without your teammates. And you need to find out a way to start liking people. You need to reach down into hearts, your heart. Look into your hearts and see how God anoints you to love somebody. Verse 26, who's there? Real big for me. So we're looking at, when we're looking at this, these verses, verses 26 through 30, is where the author makes the change, the switch. He switches from what Jesus has done, and he looks back into the Old Testament and talks about the law of Moses. This, these are the verses where I warn you, be careful that you think not that you can lose your salvation. For he talks about the fact that they were fearfully looking for the judgment and the indignation. It was a fiery indignation, which shall divide the adversaries. This is the deal. In the Old Testament, and you can find this in Numbers, Numbers chapter 15, in the Old Testament, we see where, where they would actually get rid of a person. They would cut them off from their families, cut them off from other people, if they willfully sinned. And therefore it says, because you have willfully sinned, there are no more sacrifices for you. Because you, you just doing sin of commission as you figure, as you want. <laughs> have it your way. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. He said to us, in the days of Moses, they would cut people off. If little boys would disobey their parents, they would stone them to death. 
And he wouldn't ever disobey again. Yeah. Poor 11, 11 year olds and 12 year olds would be dismissed from the world because they've been told over and over and over again, don't put paper wrappers under your bed. Don't put food in the corner of your bedroom. Simple stuff. Disobedient. But God has given us grace. God has given us grace. If a, if, a, if a person got caught in adultery, they would take them out and stone them to death. They didn't have guns like we have. They would, and then they would make it a public thing. The whole city would come out. They would watch it. And they would get a team of people together. Stone them. Now let me tell you, even though it's not going that way in the United States of America, it is going that way in other countries. In the other countries, when yesterday Pastor Rose was talking to us, we was we were talking about Kim Jong Un and how how he assassinated one of his his guards. He was up giving a speech, and his guard was standing still, and he blinked. He nodded off. He went back and watched the video. He didn't know it at that time. Went back and watched the video. And because this fellow was tired of standing on his feet, and he blinked one time, he called his whole family out and killed them in front of his family. And his family couldn't, couldn't blink because they would have been missed. This is happening in the 21st century. This is happening right now. We are far removed from that. But the text declares that when they willfully sin, now this guy wasn't willfully sinning, he's got, he got killed. But the fact of the matter is, when we willfully sin, there's no more, uh, no more sacrifice. We're talking Old Testament. And besides, it's not talking about salvation, it's talking about sanctification. It's talking about living a holy life. The whole text has to be in context. And as we live a holy life today, we have good news. Sister, Sister Woods asked the question, is there grace? Verse number 30, ask the question, it asks the question, has done despite unto spirit of grace? God has given us grace. Ashen, has God given you grace? He has, because you have not disobeyed your parents, though, right? Oh, you have. <laughs> so when we look at this, when we look at this, God has given us grace. And he's given us grace even though we willfully sin. But the same God is a just God. We move from the Old Testament law to grace. And God just keeps blessing us. Keeps blessing us. And he talks about in verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two, under two or three witnesses. So they killed people with witnesses. Without mercy. Question or comment? Look at verse number 30. Someone read for me. Read real big for me. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. For he has compassion of me in my bounds and took oh. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were ill Illuminated. Illuminated. He endured a great fight of afflictions. 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 Partly with ye were made a gasping shock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly with ye became companions of them that were so used. Okay, thank you. Where'd you stop? Okay, so we'll pick back up at 34. Okay, so thank you. So when we look at this, God says, the vision belongs to me. What does 
that mean? What is he saying? So, so what did he say? Visions belong to me. What is God saying? So, so what? Say it again. Vengeance, vengeance, sin. Vengeance, what does it mean when he says vengeance belongs to me? In that? Okay, sister, 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 him. Uh, so you don't have to go out and, and kill somebody or hurt somebody because somebody did you wrong. Just take it to the Lord and you don't have that situation for you. Okay, so take it to the Lord. He, he will take care of it. Because in the Old Testament, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. People think that now? Yeah. If, if somebody do me wrong, I do, wrong, I do them wrong. Is that God's way? No. Why do you say it's not God's way? Because he just said vengeance belongs to the Lord, right? So if vengeance belongs to the Lord, then why are we doing what we do? Man in his own right. Man doing what man wants to do, right? <laughs> And he's doing it willingly. He, he keeps doing it willingly. He keeps doing it willingly over and over again. Be careful that you don't take the position of God. Be careful that you don't become God. Be careful that you don't judge others and then sentence them to death because they messed over you. So what are we to do then? What should we do if we can't get back at them, what, we should, what should we do? Pray. Pray. Go to God. Sister Paul, what should we do if they misuse you? Pray for them. We sure got a lot of praying people in this church. <laughs> Dig it out. If somebody do you wrong, what you gonna do? Go pray for them. Y'all got all the right answers. Ashi, what you gonna do if somebody do you wrong? Huh? Let God handle it. I can't hear you. Let God handle it. Let God handle it. Sandra, what you gonna do if somebody no. do you wrong? I think uh, a lot of people when somebody does something wrong, don't cry, you know, take it away for the people. But uh, we have to pray and uh, ask God for Jesus. Okay, we have to pray. And we even she said we even have to pray for the person that did us wrong. My, my, my. And ask God to forgive them. I thought the thing was to ask them, have them ask God to forgive them. But now we've introduced a new concept, and that concept is we not only pray, we pray for the person who has misused us and ask God to forgive them. And that's what the Bible says, pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for them. It also says feed them, give to them. One of the hardest things that I had to do, working at Conoco Phillips, drive one, one full hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes, all the way to Sweeney, Texas, every morning and every evening. One of the hardest things I had to do is pray for Jeff. Jeff was my coworker that made it his business to make life hard for me. If I fix the device, he'll make sure that he tampered with it. He'll make sure it looked like I didn't fix it. And then in the midst of my fixing it, he will come and make the comment. And one day, I, I Jeff really almost set the wrath. But one day, Jeff got, to, got me to that point where I almost lost my job. One day, Jeff got me to the point where I almost laid hands on him. The pastor of the New Beginning Church. I almost laid hands on him. Guess what? On my way back home one day, on Friday I rode by myself. I didn't have a carpool on Friday because we worked different shifts. So I'm riding back that Friday. An hour and 15 minutes, good time to talk to the Lord. And my prayer was, Lord, bless Jeff. Bless his family. Bless his wife. Give them what they need to survive. Give them what they need to eat. God bless them. <clears throat> so, Zimmer, what's wrong with that? Well, there was nothing wrong with it by you praying for him. Mm. Because if you would have hit him or did something to him, he probably was in jail somewhere. 
Then the record would, well, at that time, I wasn't even pastor New Beginning. Then I wouldn't have had a chance. They would have pulled up my record and saw I had laid them out. Because if I, if I had gone for it, I was going to go for the jungle thing. Yeah, you would have been in jail by now. And Sister Hickman would have been like, no, we don't need him. <laughs> no, we don't need him. <clears throat> she would have been like, look, look, poor pick a minute. <laughs> Forget about him. It's over. So, so we need to understand when we leave it to God, God repays. Vengeance belongs to God. God is the one who, who sets set, set things right. God is the one. And then it goes on to say in verse number 31, it is a, it is a serious thing. It is a fearful thing. It is a dangerous thing to fall in the hands of the true and the living God. What is that all about? It is a dangerous thing, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. In other words, God sees us. God sees our conditions. God sees everything that goes on around us. And if you are saved and you fall into the hands of the living God, then God has to judge you and he got to deal with you. That's why we pray for our enemies, so God won't have to deal with us. <laughs> you knew when you grew up, when you were growing up, you would say, but he hit me first. And they said, you should have come told me. You never should have hit him back. That's a hard thing here. Especially as a boy. <laughs> we always talk as boys, don't start anything, but make sure you end it. And I grew up ending it. But the closer, look at, look at the text. The text says, we draw near to God. And the more we draw near to God, the more our attitudes change. The more uh, the way we look at things change. As we draw near to God through Jesus Christ, the better we look at things. And then we can accept the fact that vengeance belongs to the Lord. The hardest thing I had to do is pray for Jeff. Now, that was the hardest thing. I, that's the hardest thing I ever had to do is to pray. And then when I prayed, I couldn't say God killed him. I couldn't say God get him. My prayer was Lord bless him. And God fixed him. <coughs> God will fix it. But we must call on the remem remembrance of the former days in which after the illumination, we endured a great fight of affliction. We need to understand that we will be afflicted with many things, health-wise. We will be afflicted with attacks on our, our Christianity, our lives. We will be afflicted on attacks with our health, and you've already said it. The governor did not have to make it hard to live with mass mandate, mandates. He could have left it up to the cities and the, and, and the divisions within the state. Or he could have just left it alone. But to deliberately go out and try to hurt somebody, try to deliberately tell you that you can't wear one, wear a mask. That is foul. That is political. That is ignorant. That is evil. That is ungodly. That is satanic. That is not of God. But we have to remember that God has blessed us. And as we look at our former days, the former days of the Old Testament, and we realize that God has a new plan. He has a new way of living. And that is to live through Jesus Christ. We got to have make sure that we, we remember the illuminations. The light has been brought to us. We're different now. Our faith is what keeps us strong. We have, we have to remember we were a gazing stock. Both reproaches and afflictions. And partly we, we had co companions. We need to understand 
that we were being made mockery of. <clears throat> this gazing stock was <clears throat> that we were a spectacle. We were somebody that they looked at and laughed at. And even today, if you try to live for the Lord, you're going to become somebody that's been being laughed at. How many of you have been told, it doesn't take all that to be right with God? You ain't got to do all that. You ain't got to go down to that church every Sunday. You don't have to listen to church all day long. You don't have to do that. They make us spectacles. Who wants to read the last three verses here? <coughs> For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. And 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Amen. Let's just see what that word might mean. <laughs> it says you might receive the promise. Let's... The, word, the word might really, really means that you will properly be provided. <laughs> that you will receive. That you, you, you will receive it for sure. So we need to understand that, that God has, has blessed us. But we have had compassion. God has had compassion on us. Even in our bond. This went, you know, we, we don't really know who the author of Hebrews is, but this particular verse makes us think that it is Paul. Some say Luke, some say Paul. But look at the words that he chooses to use. Compassion for me in my bonds. That's kind of stuff Paul used to talk about. All the way through, through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, he reminds the church of Thessalonica that, that I'm in my bonds. I'm locked up and I'm in prison. And to joyfully the spores. Somebody say something. He was a bond servant. He was a bond servant. In other words, he was a prisoner. He was locked up. So this gives us some clue. But it's not necessary that it is the truth. So we, we need to understand that, that, uh, that God has a way of blessing us in spite of us. He has a way of blessing us in spite of us. He gives us compassion. Has God been compassionate to you? Do you deserve everything that you receive? Do you deserve everything that you will get or will receive? Knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance is better. We need to stop fighting for stuff down here. Because whatever we can come across down here is better over there. You hear me? It is better. Really, we haven't seen. Really, we haven't heard what good things that God has in store for us who persevere, who keep the faith, who don't let stuff go and make us do crazy stuff. We got a reward. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Let me just share with you. We have great rewards. We have great rewards. We have great rewards for what we do, what we say, how we feel, what we think. We must endure the suffering. We must endure the affliction. We have to get through it. That's why I tell people, wearing a mask is nothing compared with a big old uh, three-quarter inch tube down your throat. Not knowing if you're in the world or not. What a mask. It's just a little thing. It's a, and the suffering that we're going through now, it's just a little thing. Paul says, 
this everyday common suffering is nothing. It's nothing to be compared to the glory that is going to be re revealed through Christ Jesus. It's nothing. It's, it's really nothing, y'all. We've been wearing masks for almost two years, if not two years. The fact of the matter is, let's wear a mask. But what, what the text is saying here is that we got to hold un, unswervingly to our faith because there's a better thing for us in heaven. We're going to have rewards. There are enduring, enduring substance. Enduring substance. This substance are remaining. It's perpetual. It's everlasting. These are rewards that God will grant us and give us from now on. Cast not away therefore your confidence because there are rewards. Verse 36 says, For ye have a need for patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. In other words, just be patient. Just hang in there. In other words, just stay, stay the course. Don't let anybody or anything distract you. We watched the Olympics. And the relay team came in first place. Alex Felix did not allow having a baby <laughs> stop her from getting a medal. The girls on the track, they strip down. Paul says, whatever you do, lay aside every weight that so easily besets you and run this race with patience. In other words, when you look at people on the track field, male and female, they are completely stripped down. They got on a little of nothing, so nothing will hold them back. So don't let the distractions, don't let what people say hold you back because there's a reward. And God's reward is eternal. God's reward keeps right on giving this perpetual. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, it says you might. But when we looked up that word in the Greek, the word might says for sure that you will receive. Remember, we're reading, we're reading 2,000 years in language. 2,000 years old language. So when you use the word might, you have to make sure you look at the Greek and the Hebrew. So we said that that word, that word might means that you will actually receive it. In other words, he who have promised, he who has promised, is faithful. And he will reward us. He did it through Jesus Christ. And if you're listening to me today and you can believe that Jesus died and rose again, you can be saved right here. Just repeat out to me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Amen and thank God. We believe this story. We believe this prayer. We believe you trust in Jesus will make you whole and guarantee you a place in heaven. Thank you for listening to our Sunday School. Thank you for being a part. Uh, if you want to give to our Sunday School class, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box. 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part. Thank you for uh, watching and being a part of our service. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless this word, that this word will resonate with us, that this word, Father God, will be a part of our lives, that men, women, boys, and girls will recognize who Jesus is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and thank God. God bless you and God keep you.
please join us at 10.30 a.m. this morning for our regular worship service. Thank you and be blessed.